Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to another cardiophysiology video in my cardiology playlist. Your heart is like a factory. There is an input going into the heart and there is output leaving the heart. The input is via veins, whereas the output is through arteries. Any factory that has an output can measure that output, roughly speaking, by multiplying the number of employees times the productivity per employee. Similarly, you can calculate the cardiac output by multiplying how fast the heart is pumping, i.e. beats per minute, times the volume ejected per beat. In today's lecture, we'll talk about the cardiac output, the cardiac index, heart rate and stroke volume. We'll talk about the end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, ejection fraction. This video builds upon previous videos in my biology playlist and in my cardiology playlist, such as the cardiovascular system video and my video on the cardiac cycle and blood pressure. Here's your wonderful heart. How many hearts do you have anatomically? One. Physiologically, two. There is the right heart and there is the left heart. Let's start here. Left ventricle pumps blood to the aorta. This is oxygenated blood. The aorta distributes this oxygenated blood to every organ in your body. Each cell takes in oxygen and nutrients from the arterial side and dishes out carbon dioxide and waste into the venous side. The venous side will go here, inferior vena cava and superior vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle passing through the tricuspid valve by the way every valve in your heart has three cusps except this one this one between the left atrium and the left ventricle has only two cusps it's the mitral valve why do they call it mitral because it's similar to la mitre which is a religious hat for some Catholic clergyman. Back to the deoxygenated blood in the right ventricle. It will be pumped through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary artery, and then it will take me to the lungs. The lungs will get rid of that carbon dioxide through exhalation, and then inhale some oxygen. All of that oxygenated blood will go to the left atrium via pulmonary veins. Then oxygenated blood enters left atrium and then through the mitral valve we go to the left ventricle and then you repeat the story again. What's the next valve here? Aortic valve. The basic idea is that your heart is a factory. There is input to that factory, there is output from that factory and then you distribute the widgets. The input to the heart comes through veins. If you are the right heart it comes through the superior and inferior vena cava. If you are the left heart, it came through the pulmonary veins. So input is venous. Let's talk about output. If you are the right ventricle, your output will go through the pulmonary veins. If you are the left ventricle, your output will go through the aorta. So the output is arterial. Then these arteries will distribute that oxygenated blood to every organ in your body. Input is venous, output is arterial. Let's forget the distinction between the right heart and the left heart for a second and let's just imagine it's one chamber. There is input coming to that chamber and there is output leaving the chamber. The output leaving the chamber is going to arteries and therefore is going to be responsible for arterial blood pressure. How do I measure the output of that factory? You need the number of employees working in that factory times the productivity per employee. How many times the heart is pumping per minute is called the heart rate. Beats per minute times the volume ejected per beat. How fast times how strong the heart is beating equals the output of the heart in every minute. Heart rate is measured in beats per minute. Stroke volume is measured in ml or volume per beat. And then the beat will cancel with the beat. And you end up with ml on top, minute at the bottom. This is the measuring unit for the cardiac output, which is about 5 liters per minute or 5,000 mls per minute. So hey, Metacosis, how much does my left ventricle pump per minute? 5 liters per minute. How about my right ventricle then? also 5 liters per minute. And what's the average volume of the adult blood? It's about 5 liters. So you're trying to say that my blood circulates throughout the entire body once every minute? That's true. 
And your heart has been doing this every minute, in every hour, in every day, in every week, in every month, in every year that you've been alive. Look, these numbers are just approximations to make the calculation easy. So that 100 times 50 equals 1000 ml per minute. In real life, if you want to be more accurate, this is more like 70 and this is more akin to 70. A pearl for the pros. Do you know the equation of the cardiac output is exactly the same as the equation of what? Minute ventilation for the lungs, which is the ventilation of my lungs per minute. How much is that? Well, how fast is the lung breathing? It's called the respiratory rate times how much air do I get in per breath? And this is called the tidal volume. When you multiply the tidal volume times respiratory rate, you get the minute ventilation, which is equivalent to the cardiac output. It's the same exact concept. How fast times how strong. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Why should I care about this? Because during pregnancy, the volume of plasma goes up, which means the volume of blood goes up, which means there is more input of blood coming to mommy's heart, which means the output has to be higher. When the venous return that's returning to the heart goes up, the stroke volume goes up, which means the cardiac output goes up. Moreover, in pregnancy, the heart rate also usually goes up. So in a nutshell, pregnancy has high cardiac output, which makes sense because mommy now has to support herself and the baby. Now, is it fair to compare the cardiac output of a tiny person like Medicosis with someone huge like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, The Rock, or whomever? No, it's not fair. If you compare my heart to his heart, you will be under the impression that I have heart failure because my heart sucks compared to his. So what should we do? Well, let's make it fair. Let's divide the cardiac output per body surface area. You divide my cardiac output by my body surface area and his big cardiac output over his big body surface area. And when you do this, you will realize that my heart is normal and I do not have heart failure. And this is called a cardiac index. ML per minute is for cardiac output. Square meters is the measuring unit for the surface area. Therefore, here is the measuring unit of the cardiac index. This cardiac output is important because who's going to depend on the cardiac output? Your blood pressure. I mean the mean, average, systemic, not pulmonic, arterial in the systemic arteries like the radial artery, blood pressure. Pressure of blood in the systemic arteries averaged. And this equals cardiac output, which equals what? Heart rate times stroke volume multiplied by the total peripheral resistance, which depends on the radius. To keep it nice and easy, think of the resistance as the opposite of radius. But it's not any radius, it's radius raised to the fourth power. The lower the radius, the greater the resistance. If the radius decreased to half of its original value, do you know what's going to happen to the resistance? Please do not say it's going to double. Mm -mm. It's two power 4, i.e. the resistance will increase and go up. It will become 16 times greater than the original value. So vasoconstriction decreases the radius, increases the resistance, which increases the total peripheral resistance, which means the blood pressure will go up. Conversely, vasodilation increases the radius, lowers the resistance, and lowers my blood pressure. The input is venous, the output is arterial. The cardiac output affects my arterial blood pressure because blood pressure equals cardiac output times TPR. The input is venous, right? So we can call that input venous return. And when the heart is receiving blood, the heart will relax diastole. So the volume of blood in the heart at the end of diastole is the end diastolic volume, which equals the venous return, which equals the preload, which is the load given to the heart pre before the heart contracts. Then what would you call the load put upon the heart after it contracts? After load, and it will be arterial. After load is arterial. Next, many students struggle with the concepts of ejection fraction and diastolic and systolic and all of this nonsense. It's a piece of cake. Look, imagine that I gave you 10 apples. You decided to keep four apples for you and eject or give away six apples. Let me ask you a question. How many apples did you eject? Answer, six. What's the volume of apples that you ejected? Six apples. 
the volume that you ejected is your stroke volume. So the stroke volume is six apples. The four apples that you decided to keep is the end systolic volume, which is the volume remaining in the heart at the end of systole, i.e. it didn't leave the heart during contraction. So when I came at the end of systole, after the heart has finished contraction, I found four apples still with you that you did not eject. And what do you call the 10 original apples that I gave you end diastolic volume? Because at the end of diastole, you just relaxed and accepted all the apples, you had 10. 10 is the end diastolic volume, 4 is the end systolic volume, the difference between them is the stroke volume. So stroke volume equals end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. Okay, if I gave you 10 apples and you ejected 6, what's the percentage that you ejected? Of course, it's going to be 60%. That's right, and we call this the ejection fraction. But hey, medicosis, let me ask you a question. Did I eject 6 apples or did I eject 60%? Well, if you're talking in absolute terms, the answer is 6 apples. But if you're talking in relative terms, it is 60%. The stroke volume is 6 because the stroke volume is the difference between the two. The ejection fraction is this stroke volume that you ejected over what I gave you in the beginning. So it's the stroke volume over the end diastolic volume. And since we know that the stroke volume is EDV minus ESV, we can also say that the ejection fraction is EDV minus ESV, which is the stroke volume, over EDV. What you ejected over what I gave you in the beginning absolute terms versus relative terms. So if the heart receives more input, i.e. more preload, which means more venous return, which means more end diastolic volume, of course the stroke volume will increase. If I gave you 20 apples instead of 10, of course you can eject more. Assuming that you will still eject 60%, 60% times 20 is greater than 60% times 10, which means that your cardiac output goes up because cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. So if the stroke volume goes up, cardiac output goes up. And when cardiac output goes up, arterial blood pressure goes up. What are the factors that affect my cardiac output then? Well, preload affects the cardiac output, afterload affects the cardiac output, enotropy or the force of contraction of the heart affects the cardiac output, as well as the heart rate. Let's talk about that. Remember please that preload is venous, but the afterload is arterial. Hey preload, I mean venous return, I mean end diastolic volume, I mean the input to the heart. If you go up, of course more input equals more output. Let's dig deeper. More input equals more stroke volume equals more cardiac output. What are the factors that will increase the input, i.e. the preload, i.e. the venous return, i.e. the EDV of the heart? How about if I have more blood, like in pregnancy? Or if the doctor gave me too much fluids, this will raise the preload, which will increase the cardiac output. How about increasing my venous tone? Oh, if your veins constrict, they will be able to force more blood from your ankles to your heart, upwards, they are squeezing themselves more. More input equals more output. What if I increase the skeletal muscle pumping action? Let's talk about the skeletal muscles of your leg. The reason your blood is capable of going up against gravity is, number one, that the veins have valves. Number two, is that your skeletal muscles in your legs contract and force the blood to go up and not down. Third, you have negative intrathoracic pressure in your pleural cavity. The more negative this pressure becometh up here, the more you suck blood upwards, which means the greater the venous return, which means higher preload and higher cardiac output. How about if this atrium contracted more? Then you will push more blood to the ventricle, which means you're increasing the ventricular end diastolic volume, which means you're increasing the stroke volume, which means you will increase the cardiac output. Let's talk about the opposite, the factors that can decrease the venous return or decrease the EDV. What if I have pericardial effusion? Or worse, cardiac tamponade, accumulation of fluid or blood around the heart. Or what if my pericardium is calcified as hard as a rock, constrictive pericarditis? Do you think my heart will be able to relax and accept all of that blood input? No, my heart will not be able to accept all of that blood. Therefore, what's going to happen? 
preload will go down, cardiac output will go down. Similarly, if my ventricle, not the pericardium per se, but the ventricle itself is very stiff, as in restrictive cardiomyopathy, which could be caused by sarcoid amyloid hemochromatosis cancer and fibrosis. Do you think my heart will be able to relax and receive all of that input? No. No input equals less cardiac output. Next, how does the afterload, which is arterial, affects my cardiac output? Think about it. Increased afterload could happen because my arteries are constricting. When you constrict something, you increase the resistance, which increases the pressure in the arteries. Now, put yourself in the shoes of the left ventricle. Is it easier or harder for you to pump blood when the arteries in front of you are constrict? Of course it will get harder. Therefore, what's going to happen to the volume that you will eject? It will get lower, which means the cardiac output will go down. And when you pump less blood and I look inside that ventricle after systole, at the end of systole, what will be the volume? Oh, more blood will stay here because less blood was ejected. Instead of ejecting six apples, I ejected three. What's going to happen? Well, seven will remain inside instead of four, which means the ESV went up. And when the ESV goes up, what's going to happen to the stroke volume, which is the difference between EDV and ESV? Of course, it will decrease. Next, the effect of force of contraction, contractility, enotropy, on the cardiac output. Of course, the stronger I contract, the greater the output. Because if you contract harder, you will eject seven apples instead of six. 70% instead of 60%, leaving less apples left after the contraction, i.e. lower ESV, which means the stroke volume is higher because you ejected seven apples, ejection fraction is higher, cardiac output is higher. Next, heart rate. Be very careful here. Under physiological conditions, if your heart rate increases a little, your cardiac output increases a little. However, don't forget that your body has some regulatory and compensatory mechanisms, which means your body can adjust the venous return. So at the end of the day, no significant change to the cardiac output will happen. However, if your heart rate increases a lot, and I mean crazy fast, and instead of 90 beats per minute, your heart is beating 220 beats per minute. This craziness will give us less time to fill the heart with blood, i.e. less input, which means less output. Even though the heart rate goes up uh, like this and uh, heart rate times stroke volume is cardiac output. Yeah, because when you do this, there is no time for you to fill. It takes time to fill the heart with blood. This crazy fast heart rate gives us less time available to fill the heart, so the cardiac output decreases. And of course, it makes sense that if I'm sleeping, low heart rate, low stroke volume, low cardiac output. Input is venous, output is arterial. Preload is venous, afterload is arterial. If you want to learn more about many arrhythmias, heart attacks, and strokes, download my emergency medicine high yields course at medicosisperfectionaries.com. If you want to learn about the normal changes during pregnancy and the abnormal diseases that happen during pregnancy, such as gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, Eclampsia, eclampsia, acute fatty liver of pregnancy, peripartum cardiomyopathy, and much more, download my OBGYN high yields course. And if you want to learn about antiarrhythmics, antianginal, antihypertensive medications, and even antihyperlipidemics, download my cardiac pharmacology course. If you do not wish to download my courses and you would rather watch them on YouTube, you can do so by clicking on the join button and choosing the highest tier. It will open up more than 300 premium videos for you that you can watch right now at double the playback speed if you want. Education is fun. Please subscribe, hit the bell, click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionaris, where medicine makes perfect sense.